four two, uh, and for the women's it's one five two. And if you forget those, uh, you can see Maya here. Uh, or if you have any other questions, uh, Maya can help out. She's uh, been helping put this together. Um, so again, this is uh, uh, the, the first forum in this series uh, on freight. Um, the uh, and this I want to thank our uh, partner, the Union of Concerned Scientists, as a co-host for this session, um, as well as the University of California Center for, for hosting us here, um, but also the uh, Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis and the Sustainable Transportation Energy Pathways Program. Uh, the co-director, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Fulton here, uh, who I'll introduce in a second. I also want to mention that uh, this is the first, the next uh, part of the series is going to be next Friday, April 26th, also from 11.30 to 1 p.m. And that's going to be going into uh, more of the detail of the uh, vehicle technologies for both truck and rail, uh, what are the different uh, strategies and technologies that might make a difference in terms of uh, vehicle and fuels. And then the final session, which is going to not be the following Friday, but two Fridays after that, uh, May 10th, uh, and that's going to be talking about planning for change, how regions are planning to uh, modernize the freight system in California, both looking at sort of regional planning activities and the significance of those uh, to address our, our um, energy and environmental goals, as well as uh, some of the logistics uh, aspects of things like last mile delivery and such. So I guess without further ado, I do want to introduce uh, Dr. Fulton, uh, who is the co-director of the ITS Davis uh, Next Steps Program, which stands for Sustainable Transportation Energy Pathways Program uh, at Davis. Uh, he's uh, got a, a, a very long and distinguished uh, CV, which I, which I won't repeat here. All of those are, are in your bio. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over. Take it away, David. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, it's great to see all the people here, and um, glad to see people are going to uh, have, have something in their tummies so that we can we can all uh, uh, concentrate. And um, so today is our our overview day, and really trying to scope out some of the major issues. Uh, I will admit that uh, I'm pretty new to this myself. I just moved to California six months ago, so I consider myself kind of like a lowest comp denominator. And so if I don't understand something, I'm going to uh, try to make sure that I do so that hopefully that helps us all get on the same page. Hopefully I won't drag everybody down. But um, I've also done some of the background reading. I hope other people have done some of the background reading. And, and you know, it's a fascinating situation. Uh, the, there are things about freight in, in California that are just as much uh, cutting edge as some of the light duty stuff that gets more, uh, perhaps more uh, attention. But, uh, and there are needs, um, you know, particularly in terms of trucks that uh, I think we need to be aware of the, the contribution of trucks to uh, not only greenhouse gases. Our group at uh, UC Davis, our Next Steps program, thinks quite a bit about climate. But uh, obviously, air quality is a, is a big thing, and trucks are the largest NOx emitters uh, in the state. Uh, and, and it's not only about trucks, it's about rail. I think those will be the two modes that we kind of concentrate on, but we can talk certainly about ships as well, and we want to think about uh, our uh, shipping ports and facilities and, and everything that happens in, in those areas. I think some of the community impacts that we get into today will relate to that topic. And there is air. Um, I, I, we don't have any air experts on the panel, but uh, we, can, we can get into that a little if, if we want to. Um, I, I would say that you know we have a kind of near-term context here, and there's a longer-term context, and we're uh, looking at reauthorization of uh, things like AB 118, the Carl Moyer, Moyer program, uh, that you know we we hope they get reauthorized in in a good way, and that's something that probably will come up. I'm not sure how much we'll talk about today, but but that's an issue. Um, We've got the greenhouse gas targets and requirements, requirements, not just targets for 2020, and then there's a, a that's to get back to 1990 levels by 2020 across the energy sector. And uh, there's also 2050 targets to go 80% below 1990 levels. So these are really challenging, and, and I think that we should uh, have some of our discussion in that context. We've also got uh, 
uh, air quality uh, goals and requirements uh, for 2023, and I think it's in 2031, what's the other one? 32, okay. So we'll hear about that from Jack Kikowski and, and maybe from other speakers. So those uh, set some interesting context. Um, I'll even uh, maybe put Jack a little on the spot here because um, I, looking at the vision document, a really interesting document from uh, ARB that came out recently that lays out both the climate and the air quality goals in a, in a kind of combined context. And some of, they don't really call these targets, but these are like assumptions that they've got in going out to 2050. And they include, so in order to reach the, uh, the, the targets there, that by 2040, all passenger vehicles sold in California are zero emission. By 2050, for trucks, the, new, the average fuel economy doubles and the NOx emission sta uh, standards are 80% below the current cleanest standards. Nearly all future locomotives operating statewide are zero emission or near zero emission, such as hybrid electric. Future jet engines are 75% cleaner in terms of NOx emissions and all, burn all of them burn renewable jet fuel. That, that could be interesting uh, to, to achieve. By 2050, 40% of new commercial ships are fueled by liquefied natural gas or are natural gas conventional fueled hybrids. By 2050, all liquid fuels are derived from renewable feedstocks. And finally, the electric grid capacity grows to meet new demands, yet is substantially cleaner with heavy reliance on either renewables or carbon capture and storage. So that's a, that's a little bit climate oriented, but it just gives a, a flavor for the, the challenges uh, that we would face to meet uh, those 2050 goals. Uh, lastly, I'll just do a little bit of a call out. We've got uh, Anthony here, uh, the head of our Policy Institute at uh, UC Davis. Dan Sperling is somewhere in the room. He is, I, I, I'm sure most people know Dan, he's not only, uh, I, uh, he never wants to uh, wear, talk about both hats, but he's both uh, on the Air Resource Board and he's the head of ITS. Um, we also have, uh, we have so much work going on in this area, we have a study now with uh, CEC and we're, uh, I'll be leading a non-light duty vehicle or you know, freight and, and heavy duty uh, segment to that study. And uh, we have a range of things ongoing and we will hear next week from Ben Sharp. He's, he's here today as well. He's, he's been doing a trucking study that should be really interesting. People are probably familiar with uh, some of Joan Ogden's work. She's doing a lot of work on refueling infrastructure and along with a lot of other people. We have a, a plug-in hybrid and electric vehicle center run by uh, Tom Turrentine. And they're doing a lot of uh, important work, and we're trying to get more into the truck side with that uh, plug-in kind of work. So for us, this is really going to be interesting to hear uh, the different perspectives and, and how that feeds into our work. And with that, let's get started. Um, I will introduce our first speaker, who is Don Anair, and one of our organizers as well. He is a research director in the California Office of the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, Clean Vehicles Program working on state and national transportation, air quality, and global warming policy. Don? Great, thanks Lou and Anthony. Uh, it's great to see so many folks here today. Uh, sometimes freight isn't the most interesting topic, and so it's hard to get people out, but I think uh, it, it should be a very interesting topic, and, um, and, it, and it needs to be. It's, uh, it's definitely one of the bigger challenges uh, we face in terms of uh, the issues that uh, Lou was mentioning in terms of air quality, climate change, energy security, uh, oil use, um, and localized impacts as well. So let me pull up some slides here. So uh, today I just uh, want to spend a few minutes um, with this presentation to kind of look at some of the key attributes of California's freight system, look at a little in a little more detail at what some of the key motivational uh, drivers for changing the freight system in the future are, and then give a perspective on how we might be able to, to, to begin to address those issues. So one way to, to look at California's freight system is to look at what how many goods are actually moved on the freight system every year. And it turns out on the roads and rails in California, there's about 1.8 billion tons of goods moved every year. And the number is so huge that it's, it's hard to put into perspective to really know what that means. So I tried to do something that could bring that down to a, a smaller level. So if you consider there's about 36 million people living in California, so that's about 50 tons per person moved on California's goods movement system every year. 
And if you pack those into uh, the average size container, um, that would be about five truckloads of, of goods for each and every one of us in this room. And I started thinking about that. I have a family of four, and so it's about 20 truckloads of stuff moving around California. And I, and I started thinking, I, I swear I don't eat that much food. <laughs> so, you know, in reality, it's, it's not just the goods that we're consuming. California is a major freight gateway to the rest of the country and to the rest of the world. Um, in California, five, top, the, five of the top 25 uh, international freight gateways in the US are located in California. And some of those are, are obvious. I think most folks would sort of guess the airports of LA and Long Beach, Port of Oakland, but two of them are actually airports, um, LAX and SFO. In terms of the value of goods shipped, they, they are two of the top 25 international gateways. And um, that really connects California to the rest of the country. 40%, about 40% of the containerized goods move through California. So this map here is, is the truck flows going to, from, and within California that, that carry goods. Of course, that concentration of goods movement also uh, brings benefits to California's economy. It, it employs a large number of people in the transportation warehousing sector alone, which covers most of the, of the freight, um, direct freight jobs. Uh, it's over 400,000 uh, jobs in California. But the freight system obviously is supporting a large number of other sectors of our economy. Um, for example, the retail trade, wholesale trade, manufacturing, construction, those sectors of our economy uh, need a functioning and reliable freight system to, uh, to thrive. And just for uh, some perspective, the manufacturing sector alone accounts for about 30% of the uh, shipping um, originating in California. So that, that was a surprising number to me. Uh, in terms of uh, how much the manufacturing sector in California really is uh, dependent on the, the freight system. Of course, uh, the freight system, well, now I guess the microphone has to be a little closer. Hopefully, everybody, everybody hear me okay? Um, the most visible pieces of the freight system for most of us are the, are the pieces of equipment, the trucks, the trains, the ships, and the airplanes we see uh, every day. And one thing that these all have in common is they're almost exclusively powered by oil. And that's where many of the problems originate from in terms of our, our freight system, in terms of the economic costs that they act, the freight system takes on, on our economy and on, on, our, on public health. In terms of regional air quality, these modes of transportation account for uh, some of the largest emissions in terms of nitrogen oxide emissions. Diesel particulate matter, um, which is uh, California uh, as valued as a, as a toxic air, contam air contaminant, and most recently the, the World Health Organization also uh, came to that conclusion that diesel uh, particulate matter is a carcinogen. So there's the, the public health cost, which in, in 2005, in terms of premature deaths, um, increased visits to hospitals for uh, heart and lung disease, uh, asthma attacks, those types of impacts uh, that could be that the freight system is contributing to amounted to an estimated $20 billion um, in, in 2005. Now, uh, we've been making progress in reducing those impacts, but, but they're still there. The other key piece of uh, oil use being the primary fuel to, to power this freight system is that just as when we go to the, the gas pump to fill up our cars, and oil, uh, international oil prices are spiking, we feel that directly in our wallets and, and in the amount we pay for a tank of gas, but we're also feeling that in the amount we're paying for goods. Um, fuel tends to be the number one or number two biggest cost for these companies who are operating trucks, trains, and ships. Um, so we all, we all feel the impact of, of the reliance on uh, petroleum. Of course, we all don't feel that equally. This is a uh, map of the San Bernardino rail yard which uh, the Air, uh, Air Resource Board evaluated uh, cancer risk from diesel particulate matter uh, at various rail yard ports um, in, uh, this is from 2008. What this basically shows is these rings with the numbers on them are the uh, number of can the, the cancer risk per million people uh, living in that, inside those rings uh, close to the San Bernardino rail yard. Basically, the closer you live, the worse it is, obviously, but these are risks of a thousand incidences per million uh, residents. So again, the, the Air Resources Board and, and um, 
the, the trucking industry and many others have been uh, putting a lot of investments into reducing diesel particulate matter. We've made a lot of progress. Um, but when you think about the concentration of combustion engines from trains and trucks um, in these small areas, you really, it, we're not at the point where we're achieving healthy air in these communities. And to add on top of that, it's not just the emissions that are impacting these communities, it's also the noise pollution, um, the, the public health and safety, and the fact that in a lot of these communities, it's not just diesel PM uh, that is a, a toxic air contaminant. There's many other industrial pollutants uh, that uh, tend to be located in these same areas. So the impacts of the freight system aren't equally shared among us. Globally, um, climate change is, is one of the biggest challenges facing uh, the planet today. And California has been a leader in passing policies and, and adopting changes that will uh, reduce those emissions. This is a, a chart of U.S. global warming emissions, uh, basically the percent change expected between 2010 and 2035. Now, the most disturbing thing about this chart is that we have a, a climate target of 80% below 1990 by 2050, and that's supported by the science that tells us we need to reach that level of reductions to really avoid the worst consequences of climate change. And what we're seeing in all modes of freight transportation is actually an increase over the next 25 years uh, and beyond. So this is one of the one of the I guess most motivating slides for me in terms of that we're not, we're not on the right trajectory. We need we need to be moving in a different direction. And it, passenger cars are a good example of where this trend this was a recent trend for passenger vehicles, emissions going up, population increasing, number of vehicles on the road increasing, but through smart policy and technology improvements, we're actually on a path to reduce emissions, climate emissions from passenger cars by about 25% uh, over the next 25 years. And then beyond the energy and environmental impacts of freight, obviously, there, there are other problems with the freight system. Congestion um, being a serious concern for uh, trucking companies today. This map here is shows uh, where the serious freight congestion is occurring. This is from 2007 uh, freight analysis. And it shows, the red spots show where the, the worst areas of congestion are in the state. And with the growth expected in the movement of freight as California's population increases, global trade increases, the entire state becomes red in the next 30 years. So this is uh, beyond the environmental and energy uh, impacts that we're seeing. We just have a, a serious problem about the functionality of our, our transportation system that we need to be making investments in. So what are we going to do about that? Um, so. Most of the problems I, I was mentioning before are related to the fact that oil use is, is the primary energy source for transportation. And how do we solve that problem? Well, one way is to use a whole lot less of it. So the Union of Concerned Scientists recently looked at uh, the technologies and strategies available to reduce oil consumption in the US and found that over the next 20 years, through efficiency and innovation, we could actually reduce our projected oil consumption by half. Um, in the next 20 years. And so there's a couple strategies that are involved in doing that. And the, the one that will give us the biggest bang in the, in the near term is improving efficiency. Um, we have the technology available to double the efficiency of heavy duty trucks. And this picture is uh, a recent picture from uh, Cummins, who is uh, a partner in, in the Department of Energy program, Super Truck Program. And this truck doesn't actually look very super, it looks kind of normal. Um, but in fact, it gets about double the fuel economy of the average truck, uh, average truck on the road today. So these technologies, we know they're there, they're, uh, we know what they are, and it's a matter of commercializing them, uh, getting costs down and getting those into the fleet. And that has the potential to give us the biggest reductions in the near term, because a lot of these technology improvements can be applied across a wide range of vehicles in the new vehicle fleet. <laughs> But in the longer term, we need to transition to repowering the freight transportation system with lower carbon fuels, such as electricity and next generation biofuels. And that transition will take longer, um, but we need to be start, start doing that today in order to, uh, in order to uh, advance the technology, to make sure we're on the right track to achieve our long-term goals. So beyond vehicles and fuels, we also need to look at how we can maximize the efficiency of the freight system as a whole. So 
So putting a, a ton of bricks on an airplane is probably the worst thing you can possibly do. Um, it's not very efficient. It uh, wastes a lot of energy. Um, and no one really does that today. But we, to the extent that we can uh, move freight from to more efficient modes from, from train to truck, sorry, truck to train or from, from uh, air to truck, we can lower the overall energy requirements for moving goods. And it's not just shifting to more efficient modes of transportation, but also uh, improving logistics, uh, using technology to uh, lower the amount of, of carbon emissions that it takes to get goods from point A to point B through better use of our infrastructure. So finally, I just want to close uh, with this last slide, which shows California's freight system uh, in the 1830s and how it looks basically today. And so this is over 170 years. Obviously, it, this is quite a transformational change. Um, and we're talking about transformational change that we need in the next 30 to 40 years to really achieve the public health goals, our economic goals, and uh, climate change goals. And so we have a short amount of time, um, and that means we need to be putting policies in place now in order to chart the course to uh, achieving those goals. So that's why I'm really uh, excited about hosting these forums uh, with UC Davis uh, over the next few weeks to really start that conversation. I think it's, a, it's been an ongoing conversation, but I think it's one that we need to really focus on in terms of uh, a long-term strategy to, uh, to make the changes we need. Thank you. Thanks, Don. And since we got started a little bit late, I think we'll just keep going, go through our three speakers, and then get into questions. And uh, I don't know if everybody has a, a little uh, note card, but I think we can still get note cards from Maya to write questions on and start feeding them up here to Anthony, who will screen them. <coughs> but uh, try, we'll try our best to, to cover as many as we can if we, we can get to the questions fairly soon. And uh, and we'll do that in the last uh, you know half hour or so of, of, of today. But now I'll introduce uh, Jack Kapowski from uh, the ARB, and he is the Assistant Chief of the Stationary Source Division there. Uh, he's responsible for leading ARB's efforts to develop and implement a zero, near zero emission freight system to meet California's long term community health, ambient air quality, and climate change goals and standards. Jack? say thank you for uh, UC Davis and uh, Union of Concerned Scientists for hosting this event. Uh, I will have noticed, as, as Donna said, that the uh, momentum on freight issues over the last uh, year has ramped up significantly, and I see that, that continuing. It really does seem to be a groundswell that now is the time to, to tackle some of these issues and get on the same page. One of the things Don did very well, and I was going to do, and I'll cut it a little short, was talk about the, the benefits of freight, because we, we don't want this, we do need to recognize freight has significant benefits. We rely on them quite a bit for our everyday life, the clothes, clothes we have, the, the iPads, the, the, uh, the Leafs and the Priuses that uh, we drive end up coming here through the freight system. So uh, we, we do count on them. And they are significant uh, uh, benefits to our economy and our everyday lives. But that does have uh, consequences. And the perspective we often look at at the Air Resources Board is sort of three different layers the community uh, impacts that freight might have, the regional impacts related to uh, ozone uh, or smog, and then the global impacts. And quantitatively, looking at this, with regard to the regional impacts, the diesel soot, the toxic uh, diesel particulates, uh, freight is a significant contributor to that in our everyday lives. And of course, this impacts uh, some communities much more significantly than others. Regionally, freight contributes 40% to our uh, ozone impacts. Greenhouse gases uh, is lower. Freight is very, uh, diesel engines are very efficient. Uh, but that number is growing, as Don mentioned and pointed out. And, and the other factor that's not included in that greenhouse gas number, it's, it's mostly a CO2 metric, 
the other thing that is included in that is the impact of black carbon. And there's um, certainly a lot of science going on on short-lived pollutants and how those can get wrapped into them. But the impact of black carbon on the greenhouse gases could significantly change that scale and that perspective. And some of the health impacts, which John also covered, uh, is very critical for uh, as part of the freight system. So what do we do about it? At, at the Air Resources Board, we have a, a number of tools. We've used the conventional ones being on top. We know how to do this. We're a regulatory agency. We've done this for years. We're, um, in all modesty, quite good at the regulatory effort and moving down the scale. As, as you reach further into the toolbox, you will see a variety of, of different measures that, that are now being used uh, that we weren't using as little as 10 or 15 years ago and counting on, and we're now counting on those. And we will need to pull out these, these more and more of these, these tools. So we've used them very effectively. These are some of the ARB rules related to freight. Uh, you could come up with a similar list from US EPA. Districts have some rule, some rules as well. Uh, we, we, as I said, we have effectively looked at this sector in a traditional way uh, for for years. And I do need to say that it, we've we've done a very good job of that. Uh, not we, I mean we collectively, all of us, including the industry, we've made significant progress in cleaning up. Uh, the, the freight sector. The industry has uh, played a huge role in, in, in uh, affecting these changes. So here's the progress. 50% uh, reduction in diesel particulate and health risk at our largest ports and rail yards. That's a great takeaway message. Um, but if you look past that line, you'll see it flat lines or it starts creeping up in, in all of the different sectors. So there is there is more that needs to be done. Lou mentioned our vision document. I want to spend a little time here. Uh, this is sort of the crux of the presentation. There's a planning horizon here, a timeline that we have. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the vision document, uh, I can't do it justice within a few minutes. Please go online to the ARB website. And and do a search for Vision 2050. It is a, it is a good document to, to become familiar with on freight issues. This timeline, which is part of that document, takes a look at the climate goals that we have on the top part, 2020 and 2050, as we mentioned, and some of our national ambient air quality standards on the bottom part, as we mentioned, 2023, 2032, we expect future standards in the 2050 time frame. And what we were trying to do, there's a couple of things. I think the most important thing from the start, we mentioned a few um, stats that he pulled out of it. The first important thing about the vision document is that it, it's quantitative what if scenarios. What we did was look at a wide variety of different sectors passenger cars, and then a lot of freight sectors, trucks, locomotives, aircraft, ocean-going vessels. So we looked at a lot of these sectors. We looked at the emissions now and, and going forward. We looked at upstream emissions associated with it. We tried to be as comprehensive as we could in, in developing this. And what we were trying to do with these what-if scenarios is trying to demonstrate the extent of the change needed in order to meet our future goals. And one of the first questions we were trying to ask is, we've, we've got two distinct goals, if you will, climate change and criteria emissions. And are we on, are we fighting two battles or are they synergistic? And, and are, are they, hopefully they're not conflicting. And it, it turns out what's clearly comes across is long term, they're very synergistic. Transformational change is need to, needed to meet both our long-term climate change goals and our federally mandated ambient air quality standards. Significant transformational change is needed. Some of the other, one of the other messages, um, I'll get to some of the messages that came out of that in the next slide, but 
um, one of the others I will point out is the more aggressive of these is actually the 2032 ambient air quality standard. If we make the transformational change to meet the 2032 standard, then the then we are on a pathway to meet the 2050 target. We have additional time for fleet turnover, and we're in a good position to do that. But 2032 and the timing of 2032 actually is the, the critical concern. And it means we really need to start now. If you start backing off, much of this technology is not readily available to us today, and you back off um, early deployment, expanded deployment of these technologies, um, and and then fleet penetration, you find you just do not have enough time before 2032 comes unless you are doing it and starting it right now. And I, and I should point out the 2032 requirement, it is a federally mandated requirement. It comes um, with the full weight and power of the federal government and federal highway funds uh, associated with it. So here are some of the key outcomes of the vision, and I will emphasize one more time, what if scenarios. Yes, the numbers uh, of the percent turnover uh, were part of the what if scenarios. There were other scenarios on how to get there. The bottom line is transformation is needed. Pretty much anything that can go zero emission, zero tailpipe, needs to go zero tailpipe. Where it can't, it's got to go near zero. It's got to go 90% cleaner than the cleanest pieces of equipment on the road today. That's not taking the current technology and doing engine modifications and particulate filter upgrades or SCR upgrades or whatever technology you want to bolt on. That is transformational change that is needed. We still will need cleaner combustion because there are certain areas where you just are not going to be able to transform uh, the areas. Better action is going to be needed. Uh, efficiency gains and, and uh, that Don talked about. And then energy transformation. We are going to need to significantly expand. As we move to a zero emission future, a future that relies on hydrogen and electricity, we are going to need to be able to expand our energy capacity in the clean. I think Don talked about some of these. What we're seeing now is the momentum to look at this freight sector. And air quality, greenhouse gases, they are certainly, that's the perspective and the prism I look through, but we're seeing a lot of other areas. We're seeing other um, folks interested in this from different points of view. Expanding the freight sector, okay, we need to expand the freight sector to meet future needs. Let's do it in a way that actually looks for where we need to be in 2030. Competitiveness with other ports, a number of issues that drive us to say the, the freight, this is the time to start on transforming the freight system. So if we look at uh, the sustainable freight elements, what, what the sustainable freight elements are, we're just starting this process really. We, we need a dialogue, we need a discussion, we need to get together. Here are some of the elements that I, that I think are part of that, but I actually want to look at that a little differently, or at least throw it out there uh, as a little bit differently. If we look at the passenger uh, sector, the passenger transportation, we did a couple of things in the passenger transportation, we and again, collectively, many parties involved, that set that vision long term on where we need to be. We have uh, SB 30, uh, 375 sustainable communities, and we have advanced clean cars. You look at the crux of those two, and they really set the vision of the direction we want to go for transportation, for personal transportation uh, in the long term. Now, there's lots of other issues. There's lots of other things that come in and help and contribute, but, but they, are, they are like the foundation of where we're going to go long term in the personal transportation area. We need to do a similar thing in the freight sector. We need to set a couple of uh, clear, concrete benchmarks out there that show the pathway on where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. And we, of course, need to do this collectively. The perspective we bring as an air quality agency is important, but we need 
efficiency, we need reliability for the freight sector, we need to worry about uh, community interests, uh, we need to bring uh, technology developers in there. So a lot of different sectors need to, to weigh in on this. The Air Resources Board is launching a sustainable freight initiative. Uh, we're, we're doing this um, fairly shortly. We're going to do this in conjunction with, uh, as we talked about, you know, a wide variety of different stakeholders, especially coordinating. It's especially important for us to coordinate with Caltrans and their um, state freight plan and their freight advisory committee. But we also have uh, coordination with a number of other factors, uh, areas that we're starting here. And the objective, expand the rail system in an efficient, clean, reliable way. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. And we're just getting into time pretty well here. And so now we'll, uh, oh, um, one thing I'll just say, in, commenting on that. That was a great overview of ARV activities, and I'm sure we'll get into some more details here on that topic, but uh, some of the technology things you mentioned, I just wanted to remind people, next Friday at the same time and location, we will uh, really dive uh, more into the technology side. So, um, so some things we missed today, we'll, we'll come back to next week. Now I'll uh, introduce Ed Abel. He's a professor of preventative, uh, preventive medicine at the University of Southern California. He is an exposure assessment and health researcher with almost 40 years experience in controlled exposure human studies, community investigations of human health and exposure and ambient air quality measurements. And you have a lot of slides, so I'm going to stop talking about you and let you go. And we've got 15 minutes. Uh, do you want me to talk? Uh, is it easier for you to hear with this or without it? Or any preference? Or do you just put the recording? Probably. 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 Yeah. All right, so I'll, I've been asked to tell you a little bit about the health perspective here. And as Lou mentioned, we're going to take a quick tour. So what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the good movement in the background for understanding some of the health, talk about the air pollution and health issues, point out some of the societal choices that we're going to be facing, and then try to leave you with uh, some take-home messages to remember. First, uh, we have three of the top ten ports here in the state of California, Oakland, Los Angeles, and Long Beach. Los Angeles and Long Beach being the two largest ports in the country. And because they're adjacent to each other, physically next to each other, Although one is is run by the city of Long Beach, one by the city of Los Angeles, uh, we can think of it as one sort of complex. And if you did that, it's the sixth largest port in the world. Um, and so the operations here are really significant. Uh, I would point out only that uh, six of the top ten ports in the world are Chinese ports and reflect sort of our continuing need or interest in getting goods here from the Pacific Rim uh, continent. I've been interested in looking at ex exhaust, particularly combustion exhaust, and understanding some of the health issues associated with it. But it's important to keep in mind that vehicle exhaust is much more than just cars. Vehicle exhaust has to do with shipping, has to do with trucks, with planes, with off-road uh, yard hustles, forklifts, et cetera, as well as with the trucks on the road that move the, uh, the cargo that we uh, seem to need. Uh, a lot of work has been done to understand something about the exposure. This is work done at UCLA showing that there's something very different about being close to roadways. That a low particle mass, the actual way in which uh, standards are written, uh, mass doesn't change very much with increasing distance from the roadway. But if you look at the, uh, um, the very fine, very fresh uh, combustion exhaust that comes from uh, engines, that within a few hundred meters of the roadway, they drop off dramatically in concentration. And so there's something very different and very reactive uh, being near the roadways. So being near roadways is a different kind of exposure. Uh, if you look at the freeway system in Southern California, we have, uh, we're built around the freeway, right? That's as much California uh, is that case, but certainly in Los Angeles. And the interesting thing is if you look and build a one mile buffer around the freeways and ask the question, how many people live within a mile of a freeway? And then think about that in terms of the state. There are millions of people that live very close to busy roadways. So what does the health data show in this context, and how can we understand it? Uh, as was pointed out previously, uh, more than a decade ago, the state of California identified diesel exhaust as a, as a likely carcinogen. And just in the last year, the international organization confirmed that, in fact, there's sufficient health research to de designate uh, diesel as a carcinogen. Uh, so we know that uh, there's a lot of health studies that say that diesel uh, has a problem. There are any number of health outcomes we could talk about, some of which are listed on this slide. I don't have time, obviously, to go through all of them. I'll just point out a couple of them. But most any 
parameter you want to talk about in terms of negative health outcomes. Uh, I think there's some probably some health information in the air pollution arena to sort of say something about. It. So we know from our studies, I've been working on the children's health study for 20 years to look at the, the growth and health of California school children. And one thing we do know is that children that live closer to heavy traffic have more asthma, use more medication, are more wheezy, and have poorer lung function. And that uh, has been published in the scientific literature over the last decade or more. And we know particularly that not only do they lose more lung function, but those children that live closest <laughs> to freeways are losing lung function the fastest. They have the poorest lung function. And so if you live within a few hundred meters of the freeway, you know, those children have poor lung function and children live within a thousand meters, et cetera. That's not to say though that regional pollution is not important. What we see and what we show here is that children that are living in a clean community but near a freeway are, have about the same sort of loss of, of lung function as children that live in a more polluted area but far away from the freeway. So there's both a regional and a local contribution to their health effects. And being close to a roadway has some problems in terms of lung, out, uh, lung health, but so does living in a generally dirty place, even if you're far away from a road. So there's contributions from both the local and the regional. One of my colleagues, Heather Volk, has just recently uh, been interested in, well, she's been interested in neural developmental issues for a long time, but it just recently published, I'm looking at uh, those children who have autism, or uh, autism diagnoses, and has, has shown and reported that children that live within a mile of the freeway seem to have an elevated risk for autism. So there are neurological outcomes associated here as well. And there are a number of, not just Heather, but a number of studies that have shown this uh, in terms of various neural behavioral effects, uh, not only here in, in this country, but also in the Netherlands and in China as well. My UCLA colleagues have shown that uh, children that uh, families that live near busy roadways, this is for both the outcome being low birth weight and preterm births, uh, those that live near uh, roadways that are frequented by heavy duty traffic, big trucks, diesel trucks, uh, there tends to be a higher incre uh, increased risk for preterm and low birth weights. So another indication of health outcomes. And we've shown and published on the issue that regionally, particulate levels in the air seem to affect the cardiovascular thickness of, uh, of the arterial and carotid artery in old Roman. That's important because uh, the thickness of your arteries indicate atherosclerotic uh, progression, so indication of clogging of the arteries, if you will, in lay public terms, and leading on the pathway to cardiovascular disease. And this is a study by colleagues at University of Washington with some 40,000 women, and the Women's Health Initiative, showing again that long-term exposure to, to fine particulate in the air is associated with cardiovascular disease outcomes. So again, a number of notions in terms of air pollution and, and negative health attributes. And again, I could show you many others, cognitive function, uh, breast cancer, uh, coronary heart disease from all over the country, and many studies all over the world, many studies in all of these different outcomes. So I've shown you that there's a lot of different health outcomes. Are there specific populations of risk? The answer is yes, we know some of them. Certainly I've talked about children, we've talked about some of the other populations at risk. In the interest of time, I won't go through all of them, but there are some known populations that have genetic uh, predisposition Potentially for increased exposure because they are missing or have certain types of genes, make them more or less sensitive, and other parts of the affected populations. We don't know all the populations, obviously, but there are several that we do know and understand that are at increased risk. There's even an element of environmental justice or environmental injustice, as uh, my friend Angela Logan likes to say. Here's a map of Los Angeles, uh, the freeway system superimposed on which is uh, the population for the 2010 census in terms of communities of color. So the, the darker colors or the darker shading represents higher percentages of color. And the green dots represent uh, the inventory of TRIs, that is toxic release inventory uh, facilities where they use known hazardous chemicals. And it may be hard at first look to take a quick glance at this and convince yourself that in fact, the areas of higher color have higher levels, uh, higher numbers of toxic release inventories and are nearer the roads. But if you look at the reverse and ask the question, uh, in any of the whiter areas, do you see lots of green TRI facilities or, or uh, high percentages of color, of uh, color representing populations of color? And so I think there's an, there's an issue here of environmental justice as well in terms of thinking about pollution and exposure. In Southern California, there's been a large controversy raging about how to uh, accommodate the increased traffic, particularly coming out of the ports. Uh, so we have a particular issue with the 710 freeway, which is the main thoroughfare taking from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach up to the rail yards about 20 miles away through almost two dozen communities and expanding 
or considering alternatives to how to expand that freeway, which includes perhaps double decking the freeway, perhaps adding additional lanes for trucks only, or perhaps adding some combination thereof. Um, in terms of accommodating those cargo uh, uh, units that come out of the off the ships, there needs to be a way to transfer that to make the large trains that can pull them up several uh, hundred miles, a thousand miles away. And so they're taking, because of space limitations, they're taking off the ships, put on trucks, and then moved off to within a few miles and then transferred to trains. Those are inter, uh, inter uh, modal facilities, transfer facilities nearby. This is one that uh, exists uh, within a few miles in Long Beach. There's proposed to be a larger uh, international uh, gateway, uh, international transfer facility nearby. The problem with this one and the controversy in the local neighborhood is that this is right next door to existing schools, to an existing community, to areas that we know will have neg negative health outcomes because of the proximity to the exposure. And yet this is going forward. And actually in this case, in this particular case, the city of Long Beach has sort of pitted themselves against the city of Los Angeles because this is actually a, a uh, crosses over the city, the city boundaries at this particular point. Uh, I was pointed out by one of my friends here uh, from the Oakland area that although I'm talking primarily here about cargo in the seaport context, we don't want to forget the airport context as well. And so these are some of the inland ports, the so-called development of inland ports. We have large, no longer used Air Force bases in Southern California. This is March at George Air Force Base normally, but it's reconverted, resold, remarketed as inland ports, and now take tremendous volumes of air cargo and ship them out. On the, on the worldwide ch stage, we can think about climate change, which has already been mentioned. Diesel PM is an important player in that because of the carbon, the other uh, particulates associated with the emissions. Black carbon per se, which is a component of the diesel emissions, the strong absorber, things with little black specks of dirt, uh, is one of the large contributors. And it's something we can do almost have immediate feedback, something we can do something about and immediately change the nature of the contribution and the effect of climate change. So what's the bottom line here? I've talked, I've mentioned, I've mentioned climate change, I've talked about regional air quality, mentioned land use in the sense of the, the reuse of some of the uh, inland ports, uh, and these large footprint warehouses that are blooming uh, around the inland empire of the east of, of Los Angeles to accommodate these million square foot warehouses to accommodate the uh, redistribution of the, of the packaging of the cargo that comes out of the ports, and then ultimately the public health uh, inputs. As a conclusion, we might think about the following. The movement of freight through our communities involves local, regional, and global issues of both air quality and health. I've shown you some of that has major impacts on all of these. And there's a poor air quality associated with a wide variety of negative health outcomes. I've talked about a couple of them on a wide class of people across the lifespan, from children to elderly adults, men and women. As a take-home message, I want you to remember that goods movement is not just local, it's not just about ports, it's not just about the community that's right adjacent to it. It really is a regional issue because of the movement through rail and on the roads, through our neighborhoods, through our communities. So it really is a regional issue, it has regional implications. And as a final thought, consider that the choices we make regarding how these systems grow, where they grow, will affect and is affecting public health. And so when you make these decisions, when you discuss these issues, I want you to remember that public health should always be an issue at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And Ed insisted that we 31 slides if you do it in 12 minutes, and I think you came in at about 11. So it just goes to show you, you really can't use the number of slides as the only indicator of, and that was really interesting. Uh, okay, so let's bring our speakers up to the panel, and we'll start getting into some questions. We, we've got some questions. We're certainly uh, interested in, in people submitting additional questions. Uh, and I also want to just mention, because a lot of people have uh, come in after the very beginning, um, that this is the first